Few topics are as controversial in popular grappling discussion as the guard pool. The argument, though, has kind of become one note in recent years. One party will point out how bad it is for the street. The other party will point out historical successes in sport. Both will absolutely cherry-pick their evidence, and the whole thing just degenerates into whether or not you actually like BJJ. My personal opinion is a bit more complicated than this, and I will get into it later in the video, but for now, just keep in mind that I think guard pooling is alright, martially, if you do it in a very particular way. But I'm not really trying to argue how martial guard pooling is or isn't in this video. I think that line of discussion has more or less been played out. A much more interesting and useful discussion, I think, is how ridiculously imbalanced the guard pool is in pretty much every jujitsu rule set. To clarify, I am not arguing about guard pooling being martially bad or good. I am arguing that it is not actually all that sporting. So, Hold off on all your commentary about slams and self-defense. I'm not even going to bring that up outside of a brief mention, really. I am specifically tackling how guard pooling, in its current state, is competitively poor game design. Let's back up a bit here, though. What is a competition and what are its features? Fundamentally, a competition is a method of measuring the skill level of two parties at a given time. Or, in more plain language, a competition exists to find out who is better at a given thing. How do competitions achieve this? The answer is that they set up standardized features that we know as rules. You can think about rules as ways to control for variables in an experiment. They are tools to both determine a winner and foster a replicable competitive environment. Essentially, rules exist in an attempt to isolate a person or team's skill so that it can be effectively gauged relative to their opposition at a given point in time. For example, in chess, both players start with the same pieces in the same position with the same time limitations. In soccer, both teams have the same number of active players, the goal size is the same, the footwear is standardized, so on and so forth. Even in relatively asymmetrical games like capture the flag, teams will rotate attack and defense positions so that both parties have equal opportunities. Of course, that's assuming that there's only one flag. There are formats where there are two flags. This is pretty good rule design, these three examples. It means that both competitors start in a neutral position with the same resources. The only assets that are allowed to differ are related to athleticism because that is what is being measured. If competitors want a superior position in the context of the game, they will have to apply athletic skills to overcome their opposition and acquire it. Now keeping that in mind, let's talk about the characteristics of guard pooling as it currently exists in most competitive formats. First, it is really easy to get to. Even in formats where it's ostensibly not allowed, we've seen competitors just give up single legs so they can sit down. This should be a big red flag to people, but it isn't for some reason. Sitting down isn't particularly athletic, nor is it somehow a big brain display of game knowledge. Second, just by sitting down, you've now reduced the attacker's options to exactly one choice. He is forced to deal with your guard. The person who remained on his feet in an athletic, offensive position is now forced to engage the person who sat down in the more passive position. There are no push-out rules. He cannot strike or slam the person in guard. He cannot just disengage and walk away from guard. There is no rules-based method to reset to a standing position either. Nothing. There are no other options. He has exactly one Deal with the sitting player's guard. And again, I want to stress the guard pooler earned this strategic position through no show of skill or athleticism. He just 
sat down. Even beyond this, the top player, who is now forced to play into the bottom player's strengths, is almost always going to expend far, far more energy. In any grappling setting, it is actually pretty easy to be almost purely defensive and just shut things down. Most rule sets avoid this by using stalling penalties and a time limit. A lot of times, jujitsu doesn't have these tools, or if they do, they hit competitors like wet noodles, which means the bottom player can effectively slow the game down until the top player begins to get tired or just makes a mistake that the guard player can capitalize on. Meanwhile, the top player is going to have to expend far more effort to break down the bottom player's defense. In military doctrine, there is something called the 3-to-1 rule, which states, on average, laying siege to a defensive position will require three attackers for every one defender. In a martial arts competition, this is equally true, except rather than manpower, it's energy expenditure. This makes the energy economy in jiu-jitsu extremely lopsided and advantageous for the person who just, you guessed it, sits down. So let's review. The benefits of guard pooling are as follows. First, you force your opponent to play into your strengths. He has no rules legal options other than to engage with your guard, which not only means he's immediately playing the bottom player's preferred game, but also that the bottom player probably has an informational advantage as well. He knows some kind of guard pass or leg entanglement must be coming because there just isn't anything else the attacker can legally do. Second, guard pooling gains you an energy advantage relative to the attacking top position. Finally, sitting down isn't a position that a guard pooler has to fight for in any way. In summary, the guard pooler has forced his opponent to play against his preferred style. He probably has the advantage in information economy. He definitely has the advantage in the energy economy, and he has purchased all of these benefits for the dirt cheap price of just putting his ass on the mat while there is nothing his attacker can do to counter that decision except play directly into the guard pooler's strengths. Now, I've heard the argument made that the bottom position is just so inferior that it balances all of this out. While I acknowledge that most submissions do originate out of the top position, I think this perspective fails to account for the fact that the bottom player usually does eventually seize the top position, if only briefly. It's just that the bottom position gives the competitor more time and resources to efficiently enter that top position on his own terms and with energy to spare, usually. The reality is just that jujitsu rules heavily support guard pooling, especially as opposed to just staying on your feet. It is sort of like a chess player saying that he's going to set up his side of the board by three moves in advance before the game starts. But don't worry, he's going to let the other guy go first. That'll even it out, right? Or, in a more sport-specific example, imagine just letting top players start inside control or something. It's pretty similar, and it would be met with pretty much universal ridicule for very good reason. My major complaint with all of this is that it just isn't all that competitive. In judo, for example, if you want that dominant gripping position with all of the advantages that come with it, you have to fight tooth and nail for that in a neutral setting, at least from the start. In soccer, you have to organize your team while dealing with an active defense to gain advantageous positioning. In BJJ, you have to sit down. And not only do you have to just sit down, your sitting down is essentially protected by the rules as legitimate. There is no rules-based counterpart that your opponent can utilize to force you back into a standing position. He just has to suck it up. Now, to be sure, I am being a little bit reductive here. I acknowledge that there is skill in guard play. I acknowledge that people who specialize in attacking from top position certainly do win bouts. It's not like it's lopsided. But notice how I'm not arguing that we ban guard pooling. I'm arguing for a more even rule set that forces the guard pooler to actually earn his desired position. To do this, personally, I would implement one of, or perhaps all of, the following rules. 
First, if you pull guard, the burden is on the guard pooler to immediately entangle the opponent. If the opponent can just walk away, it's a failed attack and you have to stand back up. Too many failed attacks in this manner will result in some kind of penalization. Second, sitting will give you a negative point. This isn't really that big of a deal if you're a guard specialist. You should be earning that back instead of just stalling anyhow in pretty short order. Third, if a sequence on the feet or on the ground forces one or more players out of bounds, the bout is moved to the center of the space and begins again in the standing position. This push-out rule paired with the other rules means that if someone wants to guard pool again, it's another negative point and he has to actually entangle his opponent. Once again, placing the burden on the guard pooler for his own actions, which just makes sense. The main thrust of my argument here is not that guard pooling is dumb unto itself, at least within the sport jujitsu context. My point is that you can do it for free, and it puts a majority of the burden on the top position guy. That is not athletically competitive. It isn't a show of deep game knowledge. It's just a poorly designed set of rules. In no competitive setting should one side be able to force the other into his preferred strategy for free with zero chance of concurrent counterplay. It's honestly a little mind boggling to me how no one points this out. To wrap this up, I want to discuss a few odds and ends here that I kind of alluded to, but are a little bit on the tangential side. First, I don't actually mind guard pulling when it's done offensively. Passive guard pulling is, in my opinion, shitty jujitsu. This is an art and sport that uses a lot of breath preaching sermons about the crucial importance of control. If I can just walk out of your guard, go grab a drink, text my wife, draw up a grocery list, and come back to you still sitting there in guard, you are not controlling me. As the person still in the offensive stand-up position, your crappy technique is not my fault, and I should not be penalized for your inability to force me into an engagement. If you can use rules to cover for a massive hole like that in your training, those rules need to be changed because they aren't helping anyone to get better, nor are they producing an environment that can actually properly measure holistic skill. Second, I think guard pulling is really something that can only exist in sport jujitsu these days, or I guess some other niche grappling rule sets like Kosen Judo, but you get my point. The thing is that the sport rule set really protects the guard by removing almost every counter to the guard other than the guard pass. While I definitely think the whole guard pulling is bad for the streets argument is a bit overrepresented, there is a lot of truth to it in the sense that you can be a whole lot worse at guard passing when you can strike, slam, or just walk away. BJJ props up guard passing as this core feature, but that really only rings true in its own rule sets. I'm not saying MMA guys don't drill guard passing, they absolutely do. I'm just saying that you can afford to have far less sophisticated passing strategy when you have the full range of options at your disposal. The reason you don't see a lot of the fancier BJJ stuff make it to the octagon is really simple. You just don't need it to win in a more open format. Is it bad to have? No, probably it's not bad to have in your back pocket, but there are likely better ways to invest your time. Finally, and I think this point really underpins pretty much everything that I've said so far in this video, I think it's just time that jujitsu decides definitively what it wants to be. We always hear about how it's such a young sport, bruh, and it's still figuring itself out and blah, 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 blah. The modern incarnation of jiu-jitsu has been in the Western public popular eye for 33 years, three decades. Judo, three decades into its existence, had a unified rule set. MMA, which burst onto the scene at exactly the same time, has a unified rule set. I'm not saying that these rules haven't been tweaked over time, they certainly have, but I'm also saying that there's a definitive rule set that exists on top. Meanwhile, jiu-jitsu has tons of 
different rule sets. It's not really clear which one comes out on top. ADCC, probably, but there's even issues with that one, and pretty much everyone, even in BJJ, admits to that. To this day, there are like a billion different BJJ rule sets, and I think the reason for that is because it wants to have its cake and eat it too. I think jujitsu is, frankly, afraid of devaluing the guard play in competition because it's so core to its history and identity. Likewise, a lot of people gravitate to the art because you can play guard, so there is a market incentive here. But on the flip side of that, I think anyone that scrutinizes the current rule sets can clearly see how sheltered the guard is. It's jujitsu's golden child. It's like the favorite position, whereas the stand-up is kind of the black sheep of the family. Even without scrutiny, it seems like a lot of people just instinctually pick up on the strangeness in the rules. People just naturally pick up on the fact that pulling guard instantly purchases you advantages in a huge swath of jujitsu formats, essentially for free, and in the same breath, understand that it's not a very competitive situation. People understand that when you get to do something and there's no counterplay, that's not competition. That's just gamifying the rules. On this point, I also know that there are a lot of people out there who are like, well, if it's legal, then you should expect people to do it whatever it takes to win, man. And these are often, just for the record, the same people who are like, yeah, steroid use, totally legitimate. Uh, I don't buy into that whole whatever it takes to win, man. I do think that there is a certain spirit to these things that needs to be respected. I'm not interested in seeing a freak show. I'm also not interested in people winning just because they know how to leverage rules better. I'm interested in seeing people winning because they put in a lot of time and hard work to be better than the other guy on an equal playing field. That is what competition is. And it's really the only competition that I personally respect. You can disagree with me, but I don't care. I don't see my position changing on that particular point anytime soon. There is also a ton of talk in jujitsu about how it's evolving, bro. In some ways, this is true. I think a lot of what people see as innovation nowadays is much closer to rediscovery once you take a half glance at the historical record, but fine. In the Western context, I'm willing to admit that this stuff is fairly fresh at least. I'm also genuinely seeing a lot more effort poured into takedowns. There is a lot of work still to be done there, don't get me wrong, but I'm not about to shit on genuine improvement, especially not when the desire to improve is there. The one thing that seems to be lagging behind are better rules. All those takedowns don't mean anything if there effectively is zero stand-up because there's zero way to force stand-up. Honestly, when a rule set comes out with a way to force stand-up the same way that guard pulling can be forced, I'll probably go find a jiu-jitsu place to train. But for now, I'm very turned off by how the art keeps marketing itself as this kind of gateway to a supposed universal grappling, but the rules simply just don't reflect that. But I'm getting off task here. My core thesis is that the guard pool as it currently exists in most BJJ formats is more protected than a critically endangered species. It gets tons of benefits for really no cost. To use my gamer background, overpowered, please nerf. More plainly though, it makes the competitive setting very difficult to take seriously. I have nothing against guard pulling that is offensive with progress in mind that comes with appropriate risk. But as it exists now, why wouldn't you pull guard if you're a guard player? There is zero consequence for doing so. Meanwhile, actually staying on your feet and having a willingness to compete for superior position means that you have to take 100% of the burden. In essence, if you passively pool guard, you get rewarded for not competing in a competition. But if your opponent sees this action and walks away from your guard, somehow his unwillingness to compete is bad, even though he was the one genuinely trying to engage. 
I think this is the major crisis in jujitsu at the moment, and I think this is why there are a zillion different rule sets as well. They want to make things entertaining and competitive, but are so far unwilling to correct the clear imbalance in the core rules. At least, that is my view. I'm sure the jujitsu community is not going to like this video. Telling them guard pulling is stupid is like telling a boxer that the cross is stupid, but at least the cross requires taking on some risk and an ample setup to actually use. Anyway, I did my best to stay pretty neutral in this video. I don't think guard pulling is necessarily bad as long as you're using it offensively. I just don't like it as this weird stalling tactic where you can sit down and get all these benefits for absolutely nothing. It's just not a very good look. That's all I really have to say for now, though. I think I've worn out my uh, nerd rage on this particular topic. I will catch you in the next one. Peace.